In this video, we're going to be looking at Hooke's Law and elastic potential energy, sometimes called spring potential energy. Uh, the reason we're doing this is twofold. One, springs uh, provide conservative forces, so we can use them in our conservation of energy equation. But they're also our first introduction to forces that vary over time that we can actually do something about. We've already learned about kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, and we're learning today about how the work done on a spring stores energy and what we call elastic potential energy. The way the spring force behaves is interesting, and if we can understand that, we can then calculate the work done by a spring or on a spring and define elastic potential energy. If you take a spring, um, and here it's kind of interesting, I'm hanging a spring from a scale, and it has a particular length when it's not being stretched. Um, now, in an ideal, you know, spring doesn't really have any weight, um, and we it, it stretches perfectly. More on that in a second. If you apply a force, the spring will stretch. So in this picture here, we've got about four newtons of force, a little bit less than that, being applied by um, that applied force, and it stretches some distance x. Um, the important thing to remember here is when we talk about the distance it stretches, this is not the length of the spring. This is not a new length of the spring. It's by how much the spring's length changed. Um, in some ways, you could call this a delta x, but it's usually just written as x. Um, it's equal actually to the change in length of the spring, the delta L. And it could either be the stretch or the compression. Now, some springs are easy to stretch and they don't compress well and vice versa. But the ideal spring could either stretch or compress perfectly well from its unstretched length. And so what we want to do is we want to graph the applied force, how much we apply to this um, versus the position. And so if we were to do that, um, I've got a demo later of the spring force, and we'll get to that. But if you were to stretch a spring, you would find that the more you stretch a spring, the bigger the force required, or the harder you pull, the more it stretches, and it would do so in a linear way. If you double the force, you double the stretch length. If you double the stretch length, you have to apply twice the force. And this means that the applied force is not a constant force, but it is directly proportional to the stretch length, which is something we can deal with. We're pretty good at looking at linear relationships. So if we look at this and we think of this graph as a line, we could write it as y equals mx plus b. Um, but of course, we don't want y's and we do want an x. Um, and m should be the slope and b is the intercept. Well, the way we're defining this is that unstretched, no x, is when we're applying no force. So in theory, there should be no intercept or an intercept of zero. And so we say that the applied force is equal to some constant k times x. We'll figure out what that constant is in a second. Um, but by Newton's third law, if this is the force applied on the spring, then the force that the spring applies should be equal and opposite. So negative of kx. And this, that the spring force is negative kx, is really what we want to focus on today. This is called Hooke's Law, named for Hooke, I'm imagining, uh, for an idealized spring. It means that if you stretch it one direction, it applies a force in the opposite direction. And that's what this picture is. If you pull down on the spring, it pulls up on you. So Hooke's Law, spring force is equal to negative kx. Um, what is the negative sign about? It is all about this concept of a restoring force. And the spring force is not the only force that is a restoring force. Um, there are other forces that behave this way, but it always wants to bring it back toward equilibrium. The spring force and X have opposite directions. You pull to the right, the spring force is to the left. Uh, you just place it to the left, the spring force is to the right or up and down and so on. So if this is equilibrium, an unstretched spring just lying there, if you pull it stretched to the right, you get a spring force to the left. If you compress it to the left, you get a spring force to the right. That's how Hooke's Law, how springs behave. So what about that spring constant, that thing K? Well, every spring has one, and every spring is a little bit different. It measures how stiff the spring is. The bigger the K, the harder it is to stretch at a given distance. Um, and we kind of define it as the applied force divi divided by how far you can stretch the spring. So a really loose spring, you apply a small force, it stretches a really big difference. Um, so that's a very small spring constant. If you have a very stiff spring, you have to apply a really big force 
to get it to stretch the same distance. So K is units of newtons per meter, the number of newtons required to stretch a spring a meter. Um, be careful though, we've got two things that are labeled as Ks in this uh, kind of field of study. We've got little k, which I often write as sort of a script k, almost a cursive k, to make sure it's clear that it's different, it's a lowercase. And it's not equal to capital K, which is usually what we write for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is in newtons times meters or joules. This is in newtons per meter. It is a ratio of force for per length. Um, so just as a recap of that, stiff springs have higher spring constants. So that little plastic slinky, very low spring constant, very easy to stretch a big distance with a small force. But the kind of big springs that would be with a vehicle, a car, a bus, what have you, um, those are going to be very stiff and have very high spring constants. A big force doesn't move it too much. So this leads us to Hooke's Law. This is a graph that I generated by attaching a force probe to a spring and a mass on it and sort of moving it up and down, uh, letting it oscillate up and down and recording a bunch of points. And so what we have is that when the displacement is positive, which for me was up, the spring force is pushing down. When the displacement was negative, meaning the mass gets pulled down, then the spring force is back up. And we look at the slope of this line, and the slope of this line is about 39 newtons per meter, negative because it's showing the F equals negative Kx format, which means K is about 39 newtons per meter. And you don't know this, but the box that I got the spring out of said that it was a 40 newton plus per meter plus or minus, um, you know, five uh, spring. So it has an error or uncertainty of about five newtons per meter. So this is indeed about a 40 newton per meter spring constant. Um, and we can see the relationship between force and position here. Um, I actually have a whole box of springs of different spring constants. And here we can see two of them, right? We have the one from before about 39 newtons per meter of spring constant. And then we have another one that's about, uh, this one says 27. I think this one was 30 newtons per meter plus or minus five. So we see that the slope of the spring force versus position or applied force versus position tells us the spring constant. So how do we actually do this? Well, as I said, you can get the slope of a graph if you have a graph of force versus position, but you can also do this with a single data point. If you were to say, hang a mass and let it come to equilibrium right there on a spring and measure how far down that mass is from where the spring was when there was no mass on it, we can say that the force applied was the weight of that mass and the distance it stretched was X and that can give you a spring constant K. So Hooke's law, spring force equals negative Kx. What are the big important things? The important things is this is found by experimenting on a spring, by hanging a mass from it, by pulling it, by letting it bounce up and down and measuring the force. Um, it's not true for all springs. And this is an interesting thing. Uh, when we say something is an ideal spring, we mean it follows Hooke's law. But even springs that in real life follow Hooke's law really well only do it for a while, right? No spring can be stretched forever. You can't stretch a spring that's a, you know, 30 centimeters long like that, uh, a mile. Otherwise, the thing will come uncoiled. And so what we find out is that there's a section of the force that is nice and linear for most springs and even for things like rubber bands. Um, but then at some point you reach a place where it doesn't follow a linear relationship. In fact, most things that fall apart after they've been stretched, this is kind of reversing it. We have a applied force on the horizontal and stretch on the vertical. But at first Hooke's Law is obeyed. Then we get into this region where you apply a force and it doesn't stretch as much as it used to. But then you start to damage the spring or the elastic device. And for a very little bit more force, it stretches a whole bunch and eventually the whole thing breaks. So let's do a quick example problem of how we might apply this to um, a spring force. So a 50 kilogram person hangs onto a 50 centimeter long spring, causing it to stretch to a new length of 60 centimeters. What's the spring constant? Well, this is a Hooke's law situation. You applied 500 newtons of force, the spring stretched 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters. This gives us 5,000 newtons per meter of spring force or of uh, spring constant. What if you were to have someone else get on? 
a hundred kilogram person now gets on the spring. What's the spring constant or spring? How long is the spring now? Well, the same spring constant, a thousand or 5,000 newtons per meter, but this time we have a thousand newtons of force. So we stretch 0.2 meters from equilibrium, which we add to our 50 centimeters to give us 70 centimeters of stretch. And this leads us to the amount of energy stored in a spring and the amount of work done to stretch or compress a spring. As it turns out, the work done to compress or stretch a spring is what we call the spring potential energy. Um, how do we know energy is really stored in a spring? Well, if you pull back a spring and you let it go, you can get kinetic energy out of it, right? The fact that we can transfer from one form of another. So how does this actually work, this elastic potential energy? Well, the spring force is not constant, so we can't just multiply force times distance. We have to use graphical methods. And we've done this before when we talked about finding the area under the curve of a particular position or velocity time graph to find information about displacement. The amount of work done to compress a spring from equilibrium is equal to the spring potential energy. So if we think about a force versus position graph, the work you do on the spring, is equal to the change in potential energy of that spring. Well, um, as it turns out, the spring potential energy is gonna be the area under this curve, force times distance, which is one half kx squared in this case. And this comes from the fact that the triangle has an area of one half base times height, one half of x, the base, times kx, the height, giving us one half kx squared. For the case of stretching from a completely unstretched spring to a new position, we end up with the work to get to that place is one half kx squared, and we call that the spring potential energy, how much energy is stored by stretching a spring to a certain distance. So the elastic potential energy, one half kx squared, units work out to be joules, which is good because it is after all energy. So last uh, example here, if we want to conserve energy, imagine something like a little spring-loaded toy pop gun, right? It's got a little cork on the end attached to a string, and the spring inside has a thousand newton per meter spring constant, and the cork is 30 grams. What is the spring potential energy if you load the cork and compress the spring five centimeters? Well, that's one half kx squared or 1.25 joules. But what is the resulting muzzle velocity or speed that the cork leaves the pop gun uh, if we let it go? Well, for that, we need to do a conservation of energy problem. We start with spring potential energy. We end with kinetic energy. Um, so we get final velocity is the kinetic energy, right, final, um, divided by times two divided by the mass. Well, the kinetic energy was the initial potential energy. So that's that 1.25 joules and we get a value of about 9.1 meters per second. All right, um, that's it for the spring potential energy and Hooke's law. The, the big thing to watch out for is that Hooke's law is for when things are sitting in equilibrium, how much force does it take to stretch a certain distance? Conservation of energy is what happens when you let work be done on a spring.